<laughs> yeah, you know, Martin Mosebach says in one of his books, I, I'm i sure, you know, I'm sure that you all know about Martin. Yeah, Martin is how wonderful, wonderful, yeah. how wonderful he is. But he says in one of his books, you know, sometimes the objection is made that if Vatican II had never met, then the church would have faced, you know, would have become more and more irrelevant and would have entered into a period of, of, of you know, complete self-enclosed, uh, you know, irrelevance, right? And um, and that's why Vatican II was necessary, you know. And so even if bad things happened afterwards, worse things would have happened had it not. Uh -huh. you know, that, and and Mosebach says, first of all, you can't know that. That's a, that's <laughs> a, that's an absurd. But he says more importantly, the strength of a religion consists in its stability. Uh -huh. it, the fact that 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 whether people wander away or however far they wander away, the the religion itself should be like a rock, like a solid rock, or like a pier. Uh, at the edge of an ocean or a lake, where no matter what the weather is, no matter what the tempest is, you can always find a harbor, a safe refuge there. It's not going to change. The weather may change, you may change, your vessel may sink, whatever. But the 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 but the truths and the and the rights uh, by which we worship, if those things remain stable, then they will weather the storm, and you will be able to return to them when you're done wandering off in your confusion. But if the church and her faith either seem to be or actually are melting and moving and shifting, and you don't know where to find your foothold anymore, and you can't get a foothold, that's what's going to cause the church to become irrelevant, right? <laughs> you know, it's like that, that famous Cheston and Quip, right? We don't need a church that, what is it? Uh, we don't need a church that moves with the times. Um, um, yeah, I, I don't remember the full quip, but the point is that, that we, we need a church that isn't going to move with the times, uh -huh. right? And isn't going to be uh -huh. perpetually updating itself. Like, like you see sometimes people, you know, older people wanting to look young and sporty and fashionable, you know, and it just doesn't work, right? You, <laughs> we, want the, we want the church to remain the same. She's our eternally youthful mother, but also our mother of ancient wisdom. Um, you know, she's ageless, immemorial, venerable, but also perpetually youthful, right? And that's something I think that you really encounter in the realm of tradition. Like when you, when I go to a Trinity mass, I don't think, oh, this is like play acting 16th century, you know, Europe. I don't, it's just, this is it. This is the ritual yeah. of the mass. You know, I just, it, it seems like just and true and right and solid and always the same, you know, and you know what I mean? So it's, it's not about, it's, it's, it's exactly the opposite of what the critics say. Yeah. You know? uh -huh. So I have a quick, quick devil's advocate question. Um, I, people of my acquaintance who are very Orthodox Catholics, um, some of them say, you know, we've had the Novus Ordo for, uh, for almost 60 years, and it's been my whole lifetime. And um, can't we just, can't we just, you know, institute a reform such that the Novus Ordo is said in a very traditional, reverent manner and, you um, you know, I went to Thomas Aquinas College myself, and they debated about whether to say the Novus Ordo or the Trinitine Mass, and they elected to go with the Novus Ordo, but they said it in Latin with all the traditional, you know, sacred sure. music, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it was a very beautiful experience. Why, why can't we just do that? Well, there are a lot of reasons why we can't. Well, we can try to do that, <laughs> but I'll tell you what the problems are. The first problem is there's no such thing as a Novus Ordo tradition because a tradition <laughs> has to be something stable and self-identical. Um, and the Novus Ordo by nature can be, is amorphous. And uh, it, it's like, it's, it can be whatever the celebrant wants it to be within certain limits or, or else it won't be the mass. But it can either be a super high church expression of the liturgy, or it can be a low church, you know, um, banjo, you know, uh, um, was a jamboree, jamboree type uh, experience, right? It can be all sorts of things according to its own rubrics. It's unstable by design. It's yeah. adaptable by design. It's at the volitional control of the celebrant and the community to the extent that he involves the community in that. The music can be all over the place. I mean, it's, it's a mess. From a liturgical point of view, it's an absolute mess. Um, and so there is no one thing that you're talking about when you're talking about the Novus Ordo. It's like, it's like a constellation or a... Um, or a miasma, a, a liturgical miasma. Okay, that's mm -hmm. what we're talking about. So 
Um, when somebody says, do the Novus Ordo well, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? If what you're saying is, do the Novus Ordo with all of the most traditional options, at that point, then you, you start to wonder, well, if we're inching closer and closer to a Tridentine high mass, why don't just do the thing that the church always did? I mean, you know, and like, okay, I mean, seriously, if the Second Vatican Council had really wanted the people just to understand the liturgy and to participate more, if that's what they really wanted, all they had to do was to turn the Trinity Mass into the vernacular. And by the way, I'm not in favor of that. But all they had to do was say, translate the Trinity Mass and have the people make the responses or sing the responses. Yeah. End of story. Everybody's participating. It's like the Byzantine liturgy. Fine. But they didn't do that. They radically changed nearly everything about it. Okay. Uh, so this idea of like the Reverend Novus Ordo is, is a very problematic notion, even just co you know, philosophically and theologically. It's a, it's a, it's a problematic notion. Practically speaking, right, the people who are against the Trinity Mass, they're also against the Reverend Novus Ordo. They're against Novus Ordo ad orientem, or in Latin, or with Gregorian chant. All you have to do is look at somebody like Cardinal Supic. I mean, he talks, he talks a good show, just like Pope Francis, about let's remove the abuses from the Novus Ordo, but then he does nothing. He, he doesn't lift a finger to remove any of the serious abuses that exist in the Novus Ordo, or to... to encourage and enforce good sacred music. They never do anything. They, they talk about how the Novus Ordo should be done well, and then they never do anything to make that happen, right? So what, and then of course they, they discipline people like Father Anthony Boos. I don't know if that's how you pronounce his name, but he's a, a priest in Chicago who was just recently disciplined by Cardinal Supic because he had the temerity to publish a very respectful letter to an auxiliary Bishop of Chicago in which he explained why he, he celebrated the Novus Ordo Ad Orientem. And he explained this is totally in accord with the rubrics, which it is. And, you know, I'm doing it. My people love it. And what happened? He, the hammer came down on him. Right? Uh -huh. So there is no future for the reform of the reform. I'm sorry, but we have to be really clear about this. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I also really have to ask you, because I know several of our, uh, of our uh, participants have asked, um, if they don't have access to the traditional Latin mass in their area, what, what, what is your suggestion? And a corollary is what about the uh, Society of St. Pius X? I knew that was and, coming. <laughs> yeah, of course. And yeah, so take it away. <laughs> um, well, so what I, so of course, having said what I did before, it is a fact that some Novus Ordo masses are said more reverently than others. I mean, it, you know, if the priest has, it has, is a priest of orthodox faith and if he's a pious man himself he's going to what does father z always say he's going to say the the black and do the red right he's he's going <laughs> to follow what the missile says no surprises no showmanship you know and, and so of course you want to find if the only thing in your region is the Novus Ordo, then you of course you want to find the, the one the place where it's let's say least unworthily done maybe is how i would put it um, if you have a Byzantine Catholic church in your area, and I mean, they're, they're, they're in some parts of the country, like the Midwest, there are lots of Byzantine Catholic churches. In other parts, like the Mountain West, they, they almost don't exist, right? So it's, it depends on your area. But Byzantine liturgy, I love Byzantine liturgy. I can canter for it. Um, I've been to it. I, I've spent many years going to it myself. Um, and so that's another very good option. Go to the Melkites, the Marianites. You know, they have some of their own problems, but it's better. Um, if you have the Anglican Ordinariate, I mean, that's pretty obscure, but if you have the, you know, the Ordinariate Rite uh, for the former Anglicans, that's a, that's a very good option because although it's, it, it's, it's, it's a mishmash, let's just be honest, it's like, the, it's like you take Novus Ordo, Tridentine, and Cranmer, and you stick them all together, right? That's what it is, but it, it's better. It still is better, um, and some people have even gone so far as to say it's the Novus Ordo as it should have looked or as it could have looked. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's true. And, and again, if that had happened, if the reform had not been as radical as it was, uh, maybe we wouldn't be, we wouldn't have this fight today between the traditionalists and the progressives and everybody else um, and the conservatives as well, trying to figure out what to do. Um, so yeah, now the SSPX. Well, I'm going to start with the, the fact. The fact is, on the one hand, the SSPX is in an irregular position. 
Everybody agrees on that, even they do, right? It's not integrated into the normal jurisdictional pastoral functioning of the church. It, they, they don't have their, they don't have the connection with the local bishop that is a really important part of our faith. So there's an irregularity there. However, that being said, the Vatican has also not treated them as a schismatic group. They're not in schism, contrary to what some people still like to say. Um, they, the reason they're not in, if they were really in schism, and if they were really like outside the church and not part of the Catholic church, then the Vatican would be having interreligious, or not interreligious, but ecumenical dialogue with them, the way they do with the Russian Orthodox or, uh, or with the Protestants. But they don't. They've, it's always been an internal issue. This is like a falling out within under the same roof, okay? Mm -hmm. They're supposed to be in this part of the house, but they're in that part of the house, okay? It's, it's under the same roof. They're in the Catholic Church, and they're in, in, they're in an irregular status. Um, and, and another sign of, of the truth of what I'm saying is that the Vatican has said over the years, you may fulfill your Sunday obligation by going to the SSPX, at least in some circumstances. You may give a modest contribution to them. Uh, you, you can now go to confession with an SSPX priest and have your sins absolved. Their marriages can be recognized by the local bishop or thanks to the local bishop. So it's, again, it's not, a, it's not, um, it's not like we're out of the water and that there's, and everything is just, you know, perfectly normal and, and but it's also not the case that they're in schism and you must never ever go to them that's an that to me that's an absurd view so what would i say practically speaking i think that there are definitely situations where the best option for catholics is to go to an sspx chapel i mean and i know that for a fact because i know of situations where the only option that somebody has is a jamboree mass that's just riddled with horrendous liturgical abuse or an SSPX chapel, okay? That's your, if that's your choice, go to the SSPX. Hi, thank you for watching and be sure to subscribe to our channel by clicking on that red subscribe button and click that bell so you'll be notified when we upload new content. Check out all the links below for subscriptions to Inside the Vatican Magazine and to the Morning Hand Letters, which is free to your inbox. You stay connected. It's content that you can get nowhere else. All that information is below. Thank you.